to begin with, uh, looking back now 10 years uh, since the uprisings, uh, I think we can have, uh, I think, a, a, a fairly clear idea of what underpinned or underlay those, those movements um, at that time. And I think uh, there are various factors that we need to consider here. For example, um, we know uh, the widespread uh, uh, levels of poverty. Uh, we know issues around unemployment, uh, youth alienation. Uh, we know, of course, um, the authoritarian character of, of the states uh, in, in Egypt, Tunisia and elsewhere um, that, that ruled uh, in, in 2010, 2011 and had been in power for, for, for many decades. Um, but I think what's really important is to see those uh, uh, uprisings as not, uh, not simply multi-causal, but actually to see the way that these features of countries such as Egypt uh, are really expressions of capitalism um, in the region. Uh, and I think looking at uh, uh, looking at the sta looking at states like Egypt through this perspective helps us understand um, where the uprisings come from, and also the, the trajectory of the uprisings uh, since that time. So, on one hand, we do have. Um, the autocratic nature, repressive regimes um, built through many uh, decades of, of heavy repression um, and security apparatuses. Um, but on the other hand, we have a political economy. And, and this, I think, is, is really important. And it comes, I think, to a question we'll discuss uh, or the issues of class that we'll discuss later, in the sense that both the repressive side of, the, of these regimes, um, as well as the, the liberalizing uh, and, and neoliberal character of these regimes at the same time work together, um, producing uh, 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 very uh, polarized, uneven um, and, and uh, societies where on one hand, there were small uh, layers um, of elites uh, uh, close to the regime that benefited um, from this kind of political economy. And on the other hand, uh, uh, all of the social outcomes that we're familiar with um, in, in the region itself of around poverty and, and, and so forth. So I think understanding um, that kind of uh, initial setup is really important to, to, to locating um, uh, the trajectories of the revolutions. Uh, because what happened, I think, in 2010, 2011, is that we saw the overthrow of the, uh, these autocratic rulers, um, but we didn't see any fundamental change to the political economy. Um, and in fact, uh, what we saw in the years uh, subsequent in places like Egypt was uh, really an attempt by international financial institutions um, to, to reimpose uh, and to keep uh, the, the, the kind of political economy um, along those same neoliberal lines that were, that were in place um, earlier. So um, this, this, I think, this kind of continuity um, with the Mubaraks and the Ben Ali's of of, um, of the the 1980s and 1990s is 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 very much characteristic of of what happened post the revolution, despite the change in in in, in who was in power. Now, this is I'm talking. I've, I've been talking here about the um, the the. Uh, 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 individual countries, but the Gulf states um, really played a central role in kind of reconstituting or, 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 or reimposing these kind of neoliberal development models back on the region post 2011. Um, because the Gulf states had a, a, a really uh, significant stake in the way that the region developed um, through the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, what happened uh, uh, when uh, the, uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, measures of, of privatization and liberalization occurred under people such as Mubarak uh, and, and uh, you know, assets were sold off, land was sold off, public goods were sold off, countries were opened up um, to foreign investment. The Gulf states were a main beneficiary um, of these moves um, through the 2000s. Um, the Gulf states had uh, accumulated surpluses, financial surpluses, um, as a result of uh, uh, several years of very high oil prices. Um, they had uh, large uh, conglomerates, capitalist conglomerates, um, as well as important state-owned um, investment funds that uh, uh, expanded through the rest of the Middle East. Um, through the 2000s, um, uh, buying up land, buying up assets, um, and really uh, benefiting from the, the sale um, and, and opening up of, of economies that we saw um, through, through that first decade of the 2000s. So in that sense, um, the Gulf states were very much 
bound up or intimately connected to uh, the political economy, that kind of wider political economy structure that emerged and which underpinned the uprisings themselves. Um, so in that, this is, I think, a key reason why um, the Gulf states were so active um, post-2011. Uh, post uh, they basically stepped in uh, and attempted to steer the direction um, of the transitions in a direction that was amenable to their uh, uh, continued interest in, in the region. Um, so this happened through a variety of means. Um, it happened through obviously direct uh, military and political support, um, uh, sorry, direct political support um, uh, to uh, uh, various uh, regime. The CC regime is a clear example. Morsi, obviously, before uh, CC. Um, uh, it, it also happened through economic um, support uh, to these to these countries. Uh, we saw the Gulf states, for example, um, uh, place uh, uh, significant amounts of their own um, reserves. Um, in the central banks um, of Tunisia, Egypt, um, uh, uh, Jordan, Yemen, uh, uh, and this was this was a kind of uh, a, a new technique, if you like, of the way the Gulf states attempted to steer the the direction of the of the uprisings. Um, uh, we saw in in places like Syria, in places like Libya, um, uh, more direct, and of course Yemen, uh, really standing out here, a direct military. Um, intervention uh, uh, by the Gulf states um, uh, uh, and a, a very explicit and clear counter-revolutionary role um, in those in those uh, countries. Um, so it's it was a mix of both political, economic, military um, uh, uh, involvement. Um, uh, uh, we 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 saw a close collaboration with uh, the Gulf states and um, international financial institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF. Um, in in the case of Egypt, for example. Uh, we didn't see uh, the, the signing of any new agreements with these IFIs until the Gulf states had basically um, uh, given the go ahead or, 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 or signed agreements um, with, with CC um, uh, in, in that respect. Um, uh, uh, and of course, uh, close collaboration with uh, uh, the US and, and other European powers. Now, Having said all that, I've, I've been speaking about the Gulf states. Um, it's really important, of course, to know and to, to highlight the, the differences um, between those states um, and within the Gulf itself, um, uh, which also became very apparent uh, post-2011. Um, obviously, most clearly, the, the, the schism between Qatar on one hand and um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the other. Uh, um, and, and, you know, we can see the way that uh, all of the Gulf states, but particularly those two poles, um, jostle, were jostling amongst themselves in order to assert their own kind of regional um, hegemony. Um, uh, through all the, me the means that I've um, uh, described, so you know that 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 in itself uh, is is it, I mean is still present, um, um, and and those rivalries are, are still clear. They supported different um, um, actors, political actors, military actors in in, in various states, um, um, and 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 those tensions um, are, are, are still in place. Now, the other thing to add on top of all of this, of course, is um, the role of other regional powers, notably. Iran um, and of course Israel itself uh, and um, uh, you know so we can we can talk I think about if you like uh, these these and, and Turkey another important regional actor uh, attempting to assert some kind of um, hegemony over the regional order but the Gulf states I think have a particular role in this precisely because of the way they were so uh, important to the political economy of the region in the early 2000s um, through the processes that I've described. What you're pointing to here is, is a tendency um, on the left to kind of look at issues of class um, and to look at uh, uh, social structures and political economies um, uh, simply within uh, self-enclosed uh, national borders. Um, and I think it's very clear looking at um, the Middle East that uh, when we think about class structures, we need to think about 
uh, flows of, of people and flows of capital um, across borders. Uh, uh, so, you know, you pointed um, uh, very importantly, I think, to the uh, significance of migrant labor and migrant work in the Gulf states. Um, the fact that the majority of the labor uh, uh, and majority of the working class in those, in those um, uh, Gulf states uh, uh, are made up of uh, temporary migrant workers. Um, now, these migrant workers historically uh, were tended to be Arab and, and tended to be from other states in the Middle East. Um, but it, through the 1990s and, and 2000s have um, increasingly uh, uh, and now for majority uh, from um, South Asia and outside of, of the region, um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and further afield, the Philippines. Um, so when we think about class, the working class, um, somewhere like the UAE or Saudi Arabia or, or, or other Gulf states. Um, it's not enough to think about who is contained within the borders of these states. We need to think about um, where, uh, if you like, the, the reserve army of labor sits. Um, and that reserve army of labor sits uh, in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, um, and uh, moves across borders uh, uh, for, for, for periods of time and then returns home. The wages they earn in these countries, most of it, most of it gets sent back um, uh, uh, to families uh, 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 back home. So in, in this sense, um, this is really important, I think, um, because what it means, for example, uh, is at times of crisis, uh, for example, the 2008, 2009, uh, financial crisis, global financial crisis, is that the Gulf states, uh, uh, and, and this is not unique to the Gulf states, but it's particularly pronounced there because of the large proportion of uh, migrant workers, uh, uh, is able to partially uh, displace the effects of the crisis by simply sending workers home. Um, and this is exactly what happened in somewhere like Dubai uh, in 2009, 2010, when the global crisis um, uh, hit uh, the Gulf at that moment. Uh, so in, in, a, in a sense, and not completely, but certainly to a significant degree, uh, we see the crisis displaced um, onto families um, in uh, uh, sending countries. Uh, so looking at these kinds of ways that uh, remittance corridors, um, labor flows, uh, serve as transmissions of crisis, I think is really um, important. Um, so yes, you're right, uh, Egypt uh, also is a major um, and historically has been very important in terms of uh, labor markets in the Gulf. Um, uh, but when we're thinking about, uh, you know, categories of class, we do need to think about these, these cross-border flows. The other side to this is what I talked about earlier, which I think is the, the flows of capital across borders and what that means for how we think of uh, capitalist classes um, in, in the region. The issues of political economy um, have were really central to the uprisings, um, uh, and that that can only be understood, I think, through questions of class. In other words, at the very basic level of who benefited, uh, which classes benefited from uh, the preceding uh, thirty years of capitalist development in the Middle East. Um, uh, so that that's a very clear question. Uh, which classes um, did not benefited? did not benefit, which classes were excluded, which classes were marginalized um, uh, uh, through the preceding 30 years of, of, of capitalist development. Um, and how do uh, uh, the how does the state and how does uh, uh, the kind of authoritarian regimes that emerged in places like Egypt act to support um, and, and maintain those uh, class structures? Um, um, that I think is really the, the core question of looking at political economy. Um, uh, and, and, and it can tell us a lot about how the uprisings unfolded, um, who did what um, and, and why um, um, in, in 2010, 2011 and, 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 and onwards. Um, however, it's, it's obviously much more complicated than that. Um, and there are a few things that I would add. Uh, one thing is this question of uh, cross-border uh, flows of, of capital and, and, and um, thinking about processes of class formation in this kind of uh, regional sense. Um, so when we're thinking about who is the Egyptian capitalist class, um, precisely because uh, uh, Gulf capital, different capitalist classes from within the Gulf um, played such a central role uh, in, in, uh, in 
the liberalization of the Egyptian economy, um, uh, much of the, the key economic sectors in Egypt uh, is under the ownership of Gulf-based capitalists. Um, we can see this in the agricultural sector, we can see this in the retail sector, we can see this certainly in the financial and banking sector. So when we're thinking about who is the Egyptian capitalist class, um, it's, not, uh, it's not a simple question of uh, being Egyptian. Um, there is an Egyptian capitalist class, but we also need to say, think about the ways that Gulf capital has become uh, integrated within these class structures inside um, Egypt. Uh, um, and this, I think, is really important and an, an empirical um, question that needs to be um, examined. Uh, secondly, uh, when we're thinking about um, uh, the, 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 the nature of, of class in, in places um, um, uh, across the Middle East, uh, we, we need to be careful uh, not to kind of um, homogenize uh, class uh, in a, or, or particularly uh, labor. Um, I think in this respect. So when we're thinking about, uh, if you like, the, the different um, uh, who constitutes the working classes um, in the Middle East, we need to think also about not just those who might happen to be in um, uh, employment, um, but also uh, uh, informal, informal sectors, informal labor, um, uh, rural labor, uh, women's work. Um, uh, we need to think about uh, those who do not have citizenship. Um, and this is particularly key, I think, today, because obviously one of the one of the consequences of um, um, uh, the war in Syria um, and Yemen and elsewhere is the displacement of millions of people across borders um, uh, over the last decade. And these uh, refugees, these this process of forced displacement is also a process of class formation, um, because people who are displaced within and across borders end up uh, being integrated in certain ways into labor markets as well. So. Um, that's this is partly again when we need to kind of complicate um, class to think about categories of citizenship, displacement, um, and, and cross border flows of people. Uh, uh, very importantly, uh, we we shouldn't be economistic in the way that we think about um, uh, uh, class. Um, in in other words, think about also the ways that class might be um, racial in certain ways and this is certainly the case in in the gulf we can see this um uh, uh and as i spoke about earlier the the significant uh uh numbers of of indian south asian um and and uh migrant labor um in the gulf so you know there are all of these questions that complicate um readings and understandings of class um but fundamentally the issue of uh where does capital accumulation take place? Take place? Um, who controls that process? Um, who sells their labor power? Who is marginalized? Um, uh, really can, uh, I think, open a window into understanding uh, social processes in, 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 a, in a very clear and insightful way.